Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Well, hello there. This is Dee, and welcome to episode 18 of the Benzo Free Podcast. Don't worry, I'm not going to open with how great I feel today. (laughs) I did that last episode. I am still doing pretty good, and I'm happy about that, but I'm actually more concerned about you. I'm not sure where this episode finds you at home, in the car, maybe you're listening while taking a walk or weeding your garden. I don't know, wherever you are. I just, I hope it finds you doing well, but I know it may not. So, you know, My goal here right now is to find a way to cheer you up. So let's add some happy music to the introduction today. That's right. I'm going to add some happy music right here. There we go. Now, don't tell me you can listen to ukulele music and not even feel a little bit happier. Come on. Your toes are tapping just a bit, aren't they? Show me that smile. I know you can. Come on. You can smile. I thought you could. Well, at least you tried. You know, I really think we all need a little bit of silliness in our lives. Do you find it hard to let yourself feel joy? Especially in the middle of this stuff? I did. Actually, I still do somewhat. Although I have to admit, with this music in the background, it's probably hard to remain so stoic. But throughout my experience with benzo withdrawal, I would often shun happy thoughts, you know, joyful thoughts, even funny thoughts. Somehow in my crooked way of thinking, I felt it wasn't, I don't know, appropriate or, or even more so, I think I was afraid it wouldn't last, so why even bother? I mean, how can I be happy, even for a minute or two, if I'm still in withdrawal and I I know something bad is about to happen, or the symptoms are about to come back, or I'm about to, you know, forget something critical, or, you know, I'm about to lose my job. If I felt a happy thought sneaking into my mind during this time, I would block it. I would tell myself, I can't be happy, not now. You know, perhaps when I'm healed, I look forward to that, and I'll be normal again, and I'll be really happy then. But I can't now. That was my attitude. Does that sound familiar to you at all? Well, it's stupid. (laughs) It's downright idiotic. That's right, I said it. This is an idiotic frame of mind. This is all part of the lies that our brains tell us. We need every tiny bit of happy we can get right now. Every bit. And if for some reason our minds recognize something joyful, funny, or kind, or even heartwarming, we shouldn't block it out. We should hang on to it as if our lives depended on it. We should squeeze every ounce of happiness out of that moment, cherish it, feel it, own it, let it permeate your entire body. Each happy, joyful, funny, touching thought we embrace actually rewires our brains just a little. Which then brings more moments like that into our lives. Or at least it allows us to recognize them more frequently when they happen. And we can cherish those moments. By opening up to joyful moments, joyful thoughts, we are basically saying, I want more of that. And why wouldn't you? 
Sure, that is hard to do in withdrawal, but there's no time in our lives when it's needed more. You need those joyful thoughts, even if it's one out of 80 in a day. Hang on to it. Cherish it. Feel it. Perhaps tomorrow you might get two out of 80. Okay, I, I think I'm done with the ukulele music now. I don't know about the rest of you, but we're going to cut that. Okay, <laughs> now that's better. You know, it's it's another crazy, busy week around here. But like I've said many times, it's good. Busy is good. Our format today is going to follow its usual path. We'll have our introduction, mailbag, benzo news, spotlight, story, and our feature. Our feature today is the science of benzos, GABA, and glutamate. I've had a few requests um, to cover the science behind benzos, so today we're going to take our first look at the complicated mystery of how these drugs work. <laughs> today we're only going to focus on two neurochemicals, two of the biggest players in the benzo bonanza, and they are GABA and glutamate. I spent a whole chapter on the science of benzos in my book, and I'm not going to cover nearly the detail here as I did there. But I thought I would pull a little bit of that here and also include some more recent articles and studies and try to explain how these drugs work, or at least one aspect of how they work in our bodies. I think it's important for us to know that so that when we get the symptoms, we can kind of understand the mechanisms at play. And, and it helps to, I don't know, understand what is happening inside of us. And I think that understanding can go a long way into helping us get through this. I hope you find this as interesting as I did. And as I mentioned every episode, I'd love to hear from you. I respond to every comment and email I receive at benzofree.org, and I truly enjoy them. Questions, comments, stories, suggestions, corrections, what you had for dinner. This is your podcast, and the more content I can share from you, the more Benzo Free becomes the community it was designed to be. So please, tell us what you think. Visit our feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback, or email us at podcast at benzofree.org. And don't forget to sign up for our mailing list at benzofree.org slash subscribe. And please keep in mind that the Benzo Free Podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. If you are listening to this podcast on one of our providers, please leave feedback on that carrier. It helps new listeners find us. And that brings us to our mailbag section. I have one question and one comment today on basically the same topic, so let's dive into them. Our first is from an anonymous listener who asks... Are there any emotional support groups or organizations specifically for families and other caregivers of those recovering from benzo use? This is a little similar to some questions we've had in the past, but I wanted to touch back on this topic again. This, this one stumped me, actually. I honestly don't know of specific organizations for families or caregivers. I am not afraid to tell you when I don't know something on this podcast, as hopefully you've learned by now. And this is one of those times. I, I would think there should be groups like this somewhere, but I have not heard of one specific for caregivers. Now, there are a lot of groups around the world who provide services and support to caregivers of all types, and these can be of significant help. But as for benzodiazepine caregivers specifically, I'm kind of drawing a blank on that one. So let's, let's see if we could do something to fix it. If anyone knows of any support group, local or global, which specifically helps the caregivers of benzo patients, please let me know. We will gladly share it with our listeners and list it on the website. Or even better, if you are of an entrepreneurial mindset and want to give something back to the benzo community and, and want to start up a support group for caregivers, let me know. We're happy to provide support to help get you started. And that actually provides a nice segue into our next comment, which feeds off a similar topic. This is a two-parter from Naomi in New York City. Naomi asks, Hello, I'm new to Facebook and don't really know my way around. I'm looking to form a meetup in New York City for people who are suffering withdrawal symptoms after getting off benzos. Would you know anyone who might benefit from this? 
So after that first part, I responded to Naomi that I, I didn't know of the local groups in New York City, but I would be happy to look into it. And and I suggested that she post her question on discussion boards like Benzo Buddies or Benzo Diazepine Recovery Facebook page. As large as New York City is, I'm sure there must be some support groups there specifically for benzos. I just don't know of them offhand. And when I wrote that back to her, she responded with the following. Thank you. I know about Benzo Buddies. I'm trying to form a group myself, but can't find people. Please spread the word. Thank you, Nomi. That is fantastic. Both of these listeners who asked questions today shine a light on the desperate need all around the world for support with benzodependence and withdrawal, and for those who care for us. It still amazes me with all the blogs, websites, podcasts, YouTube channels, and charity groups, how many people still don't know the facts about these drugs and their withdrawal. This is where I think benzofree might be able to help. I know of some support groups in different cities like Austin, Texas, Chicago, uh, Bristol and South Gloucester, England, and, and so many others. And there are some benzo websites which list out these resources, but as many of you know, most of the lists are far from comprehensive. Unfortunately, that is also true of our site at Benzo Free. I, I mean, on my resources page in the regional organizations subgroup, I think it is, of the, of the benzo information sites category, I, I only list two local support groups. That's pretty pathetic, I have to admit. I, I'm going to improve that. In fact, this week, I'm going to move that subgroup into its own category and redesign it a bit and, and add a lot more content. In the coming weeks, I'm going to search for groups to list there from all around the globe. If you know of a local support group for benzos or for benzo caregivers or operate one, please let me know. Now, I, I can't say I will list every group I find, but, you know, if they follow the general practices of the Ashton Manual and, and don't claim to provide medical advice when they're not qualified for that, then they're probably going to get included. There are so many people like Naomi who are nobly trying to provide support, local or global, for benzo withdrawal, and I applaud them. And that closes our mailbag for today, which brings us to the Benzo News. Here are the highlights from last week, the week of May 5th, 2019. On Monday, Inverse.com posted an article titled, Who's Avoiding Sex? Psychiatrist Cites Three Reasons. In the article, the author identified three primary reasons people avoid sexual intimacy and medical problems, including antidepressant and anti-anxiety drug use, topped the list. On Tuesday, Benzodiazepine Information Coalition posted a congratulations to Patrick, a benzodiazepine survivor, who ran a 50-mile ultra-marathon to raise awareness for benzodiazepines. And the proceeds went to BIC. Way to go, Patrick. That is amazing. Also on Tuesday, the Middle East North Africa Financial Network, M-E-N-A-F-N, posted an article titled, Bisner Chase Secures $11 Million Jury Verdict for Wife and Children of Man Who Died by Suicide While in Rehab. The man's name was John Cunningham, and he committed suicide while in a treatment center for benzodiazepine withdrawal. On Wednesday, we released episode 17 of the Benzo Free podcast. It was titled Benzo Brain, Cognitive Dysfunction and Memory Loss in Withdrawal. It focused on the cognitive effects of benzo withdrawal and provided a few tips on how to manage on Friday, NPR reported on another warning about fluoroquinolones in the article titled, Fluoroquinolone Use Linked to Increased Peripheral Neuropathy Risk. Since quinolones are contraindicated during benzo use or withdrawal, we felt it's important to share this again here. And finally, on Saturday, PAST, Prescription Awareness Support Team, shared an article from Big Issue North titled, why don't we just stop pretending that pills are the answer to young people's problems? In this article, psychiatrist Mike Shooter voiced his concern that doctors are prescribing medications too quickly and too often for our youth. You can see all these posts on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash benzofree. 
And please, if you know of any other great articles or news that you would like us to cover, tell us. And from anywhere in the world, we are always looking for news about benzos, dependence, and recovery. In fact, probably about a quarter to a third of the articles that I post either on the blog or on the podcast here come from you, the listeners. So please, if you see an article or you see a posting anywhere, send it to me. I'd like to know about it. And that's it for our news. Let's move on to the Benzo Spotlight. In today's mailbag, we focused on support groups and the need for more local groups and for, and for a directory of these groups around the globe. Thus, I decided to stick with that subject in our spotlight today and highlight two regional support groups who have been doing great work for a long time. If you live outside that area, I'm sorry, but they cannot provide services for you. But they do have some great info on their website, which might be of help. But the primary reason I'm going to focus on these today is to show you that there are local support groups out there who are doing great work, and we just need to increase their reach. Find some new ones, create some new ones in all different parts of the globe so people have support for this. The first group I want to mention is the Bristol and District Tranquilizer Project, or BTP. It can be found at btpinfo.org.uk. This group was founded back in 1985 as a volunteer sector organization in the UK. They help those who are having problems with prescribed psychotropic medications like benzodiazepine tranquilizers and sleeping tablets, other sleeping tablets, and antidepressants. Their services, which are available to people who are local to the region, include a telephone helpline on Mondays through Thursdays, counseling appointments for assessment, one-on-one -on -one drug counseling, facilitator-led self-help groups, and drop-in service for those in distress. For those not local, there's also some great information here. Their website includes information for individual support, family support, professionals, older people, and education on coping strategies, sleeping problems, and others. This group is Ashton-based. In fact, in October of 2005, Professor Ashton gave a lecture for the group. Transcription of this speech is available on the website benzo.org.uk, and I'll put a link to it in our show notes. The second group is BAT, or Battle Against Tranquilizers, also in the same region. It can be found on the website BATAID, or BATAID.org. The BAT mission statement says the following. BAT is committed to reducing the harms caused by prescribed drugs of addiction and withdrawal. BAT provides information and support services for people who have problems associated with benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines or Z-drugs, gabapentinoids, and opioid painkillers. For those who live in Bristol or South Gloucestershire area, they have support group in the Bristol area that's open to anyone looking for help. No need to be referred by a doctor. Also, if you live in the area, you can call their phone line for direct support. The BAT website provides some excellent information about benzodiazepines, including information pages on dependency, withdrawal symptoms, the story of benzos, drug driving and benzos. There's also a whole section on training and professional services, including a partnership between BAT and the University of Bedfordshire, which is focused on the mismatch of what type of research is being done versus what type is truly needed. One of my unique finds on this website when I was doing the research was, was under the story of benzos section. It was a photo of a Librium prescription written by a general practitioner to Marilyn Monroe on June 8, 1962. In my book, I share several stories about celebrities and benzos, but this one I didn't have, and I thought it was of interest. Please. Check out BAT if you live in the area, or, or just want some additional information about benzos. You can find them at their website at bataid.org. And that wraps up my mini tour of local support organizations. Please, send me any you know of, and I'll try to include them on our website. Thanks. And that brings us to Benzo Stories. Today, I have a story from Jane in Glace Bay, Nova Scotia, in Canada. Jane writes, I am 68 years old, very active person all my life. In the early 80s, I developed fibromyalgia, 
and eventually prescribed Xanax for anxiety and sleep over the course of nearly 30 years. I had my rough and tumble days with FMS, with days of more energy in which I overdid it and landed myself useless for a few days until I finally developed a routine in which my quality of life was indeed better. Over these years, I took the Xanax and never used more than prescribed. In fact, I only took it at bedtime and odd time in the day. I was on a dose of 0.5 milligrams. Then back in March of 2017, I felt the need to take more and did not understand why at the time. But in hindsight now, I, I knew my body needed more to work. And I recognized that I was taking more. Still, staying on my prescribed dose, I knew I needed help. I went to my family GP and asked him to help with reducing my Xanax dose, with the aim of not taking any eventually. That led me down a nightmarish path that scared the living hell out of me. I was tapered by my doctor too quickly, and was never told of the issues I would experience and was on a path to hell on earth, thinking I was losing my mind. I woke on a Sunday morning in such a state that even though my husband was home, I told him I have to call 911. He followed the ambulance to the hospital. I was terrified, as I felt like I was going to take a stroke or a convulsion, and that awful feeling one gets on a quick taper. My blood pressure the EHS took at my house was 200 over 100, and I never had issues with high blood pressure. Long story short, I was lucky to see a doctor in emergency who knew what the hell I was going through. I was prescribed 0.5 milligrams four times a day for enough days until I could see my doctor with this doctor's recommendations. Still, he did not address the issue I was going through and it was impossible to get help in my area with mental health issues I was dealing with. So I had no choice but to go to a facility eight hours from my home and family at a cost of 11000 Canadian dollars. That was one thing, but this facility in hindsight was not the place for me. The doctor who represented this facility was two hours away and he was a GP. He wanted me off the 0.5 milligrams in 30 days. I knew I could not do this. I was on 0.5 milligrams once a day after a month of tapering, but the doctor wanted me off the Xanax altogether in a month and assured me I would have no feelings like I did that Sunday morning a month before when I had to call 911. I went home on the 0.5 milligram twice a day and he as well as my family doc did not at any time tell me the hell I was to experience. With no help from my GP or mental health in my area, I had all I could do to stay on this dose. But I did. But not without a lot of suffering and feeling like a drug addict. As of April 2019, I am on one Xanax at bedtime and doing not too bad considering. I read everything I could on the internet about what I was going through and why, which helped me understand and survive those dark days. To see a psychiatrist in my area was a 365-day wait. Doing well on my dose now, but not without one hell of a struggle. And I'm trying to address my concerns with a facility that cost me 11000 to listen to me, as I feel I was misled and spent that money unwisely as they were not in tune with the issues of benzo withdrawal and insist on ignoring my calls, emails, and my concerns. If I could afford a lawyer, I would have had them handle these concerns. But 2017 put me in one financial as well as emotional roller coaster. I am keeping my head above water, but I feel they should take ownership for my concerns. I am awaiting again for a response from this facility without triggering anxiety and stress, but I am so angry that my issues I had with them are not being addressed. And I do not want another Benzo person to experience what I did. Thank you for listening.
Oh, thank you, Nancy. It's it's uh, it's amazing the number of times benzo withdrawal patients wind up in the emergency room. All because some medical professional or detox center didn't know enough about these drugs. I, I'm so, so sorry you had to experience this roller coaster of emotion and pain. I, I wish I knew a quick way out. I wish I knew a quick way for you to resolve your issues with the facility. I wish... I wish you could just snap your fingers and get past this. I really do. I'm glad you are getting educated and have found some solid resources. And I wish you well. Please keep in contact and let me know how you're doing. And and take care. And thanks again for sharing your story with us today. And don't forget, we still need stories, short ones, long ones. Even if it's just a paragraph or two, I would still love to share it with our listeners. Just go to our feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback to share your story or send us an email at podcast at benzofree.org. Let's move on to our feature. Today our feature is the science of benzos, GABA and glutamate. We're going to dive into the complex compendium of scientific knowledge and ask the question some have been asking for decades, and that is, how do these damn things actually work? Today we're going to focus on the two biggest players in the benzodiazepine bonanza, and they are the neurotransmitters GABA and glutamate. Now, even though GABA gets all the press in the benzo community, it by no means is the only mechanism affected by these drugs. There are many others which we'll explore in a later episode. As I've mentioned before, some of the information presented here will be from the research I did for my book, and some of it will be from some newer sources that we came across recently. Before we dive into these two messaging systems, we're going to take a real brief intro on the actual drug benzodiazepines. I hope this isn't too basic for you, but we'll keep it brief and then we'll move on shortly. The term benzos, of course, most of us know is short for benzodiazepines. They also go by the acronyms BZDs or BZs in the medical community. They are a class of psychoactive prescription drugs developed in the 1960s, also called anti-anxiety medications minor tranquilizers, or even sedatives. Benzos were developed to combat a variety of issues, including panic attacks, anxiety, insomnia, muscle spasms, and seizures. And now, when we use the term, and when most people use the term benzos, we're referring to not just benzodiazepines, but also non-benzodiazepines or Z-drugs, and sometimes theanodiazepines. I try to be consistent in my terminology, and when I say the word benzos, I usually mean all three classes. If I say specifically benzodiazepine or Z-drug, I'm referring to that specific class. Now, many people know benzodiazepines by their brand names, such as Xanax, Valium, Ativan, Clonopin, or others. And for the Z-drugs, they go by brand names like Ambien, Lunesta, and Sonata. These drugs have been around, at least the benzodiazepines, for over 50 years. And the number of people affected by them is shocking. If you want to know if the drug you are taking is in one of these classes, just go to our website. On the home page, you'll see a link about halfway down that says, Is My Drug a Benzo? Click on that link and it'll take you to a list of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, and theanodiazepines. A, a near complete list. I think one of the most complete lists on the web. We also provide some basic information like their brand and generic names, market focus, onset, half-life, and potency. Now, I told you I'd keep the intro brief. That was it. Let's move on to the science. Unfortunately, this is where things get a little fuzzy. (laughs) The human brain is incredibly complicated. And the truth is, despite five decades of research, we really don't entirely know how benzos interact with it. Our understanding of the mechanisms of benzodiazepines can differ based on various research studies and theories. This is really frustrating for scientists, but especially for those of us, the patients, who are taking the drugs and are trying to figure out what's happened to our bodies. As I just said, the brain is complicated. It's still the most complicated machine on earth. In his book, When the Air Hits Your Brain, Parables of Neurosurgery, neurosurgeon Frank Vertasek Jr. put it this way, the human brain, a trillion nerve cells storing electrical patterns more numerous than the water molecules of the world's oceans. You see, the human brain is complicated. It's very, 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 well, you know, 
complicate it. <laughs> Did I say that already? <laughs> so sorry. But it is. We're learning more and more every day, but we still have got a long way to go. And that also goes with how our brain handles anxiety. Andrew Goddard, in a study published in the World Journal of Psychiatry in 2016, said, Anxiety and stress disorders are a major public health issue. However, their pathophysiology is still unclear. When it comes to medication, unfortunately, medical necessity and business interests are reluctant to wait until we have a complete understanding of the brain and nervous system. Therefore, we move forward and develop theories, experimental procedures, and test new medications. Even when we have no clue how that medicine did what it does. When Leo Sternbach discovered the first benzodiazepine back in the late 1950s, he did so almost by accident. I'm sure he was a superstar at the pharmaceutical firm of Hoffman La Roche. Because this new class of drugs, these minor tranquilizers, sold like nothing they'd ever seen before. And, and that's all well and good. But there was one nagging question. How do they work? They didn't know. Pharmaceutical companies are required to do a series of tests on new medications before they get approved for public use. Whether this system of testing is thorough enough is of constant debate. But even if their trials are adequate, there's still one thing that they most likely won't be able to do. Since the economic pressure to release the new drug is so intense, no pharmaceutical company can take the time to test for long-term side effects and complications. It would take years, even decades, to do proper testing. It's just not feasible, financially speaking. Now, if we have some semblance of an idea as to the mechanism of a particular drug, we can guess at its long-term effects. It's not great, but it's something. But what about drugs for which we only have limited knowledge of how they work? What about drugs like benzodiazepines? I mean, I mean, how could anyone even remotely have said these drugs were safe when they didn't even understand how they work? That baffles me. During the past half century since benzos were first released, we have learned some vital information. There actually have been a lot of studies on benzodiazepines, but not as many focused on some of the specific questions we desperately want answers to. We have theories, and some consistency has evolved from research, but unfortunately, we still have many unanswered questions. You know, part of the problem here is funding. Most of the testing and studies performed on pharmaceuticals is paid for by the pharmaceutical companies themselves before the release of a new medication. Unfortunately, there's no incentive for these same companies to do any studies after a drug is released. Why, why would they? There's zero benefit to them to find out if a drug has complications or side effects after its release. And that usually leaves the government with the responsibility for research. And with competition for tax dollars and consistent cutbacks of funding, research studies are really limited. Now, I mentioned this in the book, but I want to mention it here also. I am not a neurologist, neurobiologist, neuropathologist, or anything remotely starting with neuro and ending in gist. <laughs> so I am approaching all of this as a layman. So please bear with me. I'm doing the best I can. Let's take a look at GABA and glutamate. It wasn't until the late 1970s, almost 20 years after the first benzodiazepine was released, that neuroscientist Arminio Costa discovered what was believed to be the salient chemical mechanism of benzodiazepine action. He identified benzodiazepine's effect on a neurotransmitter called gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA, as it's more often referred. Let's start with Professor Ashton's description from the Ashton Manual, and then we can break it down to understand this better. Professor Ashton said the following. All benzodiazepines act by enhancing the actions of a natural brain chemical, GABA. GABA is a neurotransmitter, an agent which transmits messages from one brain cell, or neuron, to another. The message that GABA transmits is an inhibitory one. It tells the neurons that it contacts to slow down or stop firing. 
since about 40% of the millions of neurons all over the brain respond to GABA. This means that GABA has a general quieting influence on the brain. Now this stuff can get technical, and it's going to get a little more technical as we go along. So bear with me as I try to explain some of this. We can't really get too deep into GABA unless we also look at glutamate. In my book, I mentioned that the neurotransmitters are the Twitter, you know, of the central nervous system. These chemicals transmit messages between nerve cells or neurons. They're, they're the messengers. There are many types of neurotransmitters, and each of them has a different effect. You may have heard of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, but others like GABA and glutamate might not be as well known, unless, of course, you're going through benzo withdrawal like the rest of us. When it comes to brain communication, there are two opposing systems, glutamate and GABA. Glutamate stimulates and GABA inhibits. Together, they regulate the level of excitability in the brain. Addictionblog.org explained it best. They said, think of glutamate as the gas pedal. It excites things into action. GABA, on the other hand, puts on the brakes. Now, glutamate is the most abundant neurotransmitter in the entire nervous system. It stimulates the neurons, making them fire, and helps brain development, including learning and memory. Too much glutamate has been linked to Alzheimer's disease, stroke, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and other diseases. Low levels of glutamate are often found in people with depression, schizophrenia, and autism. Now, high concentrations of glutamate in the body can be toxic to nerve cells. If this happens over a prolonged period, it can cause damage, which is known as excitotoxicity. GABA, on the other hand, is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. GABA produces a general calming effect on your central nervous system by settling down nerve cells that get overexcited. When your neurons get overexcited, you get anxious. The more GABA, the calmer you feel. Now, GABA is the chemical, the actual neurotransmitter. The GABA receptors are the part of the neuron which can receive GABA neurotransmitters, kind of like the docking station for the message. So, only neurons with GABA receptors can be influenced by the calming effect of GABA. And if those receptors ever become damaged, then the nerve cells may not receive this calming message. And this finally brings us to benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines enhance the actions of GABA, meaning benzos increase the inhibitory effect of GABA on the neurons, therefore calming the brain and central nervous system. For this reason, benzodiazepines have been found useful in treating anxiety, insomnia, muscle spasms, epilepsy, alcohol detoxification, and is helpful in many medical procedures. But benzos don't only affect the GABA, they also affect glutamate. Let's take a look at drug addiction for a second, just lightly, because there is some connection here and it relates to this study. Drug addiction has been found to cause long-lasting changes in the human reward system. We know this. And including the migration of certain types of these AMPA receptors called GLU-A2 lacking receptors. The result of this migration is that these cells become susceptible to stimulation by glutamate. Dr. Christian Lucher, in a study from the University of Geneva, showed that benzos induce AMPA receptor migration via the alpha-1 GABA-A receptors. And in their final experiment, the researchers were able to recreate stimulated neuron firing in bursts, similar to those produced by addictive drugs. So there is a connection of some sort. But then there's also the physiological changes. Dr. Lucher can explain it better. He said, this was a nail in the coffin study. Even if you clear the benzodiazepine drug from the body, there are long-lasting changes in brain architecture. And similar results have been shown in other studies. So I know most of you probably got that just fine, but for me, I'm a little slow. So I'm going to summarize this one more time for myself more than for anyone else. Benzodiazepines not only downregulate the GABA receptors, making them less responsive to the calming influence of GABA, 
but they also increase the susceptibility AMPA receptors to be stimulated by glutamate increasing excitement. Thus, to make it really simple for me, let's go back to the car analogy just one time here. What this is saying is that benzodiazepines basically slam on the gas pedal and cut the brake line all at the same time, or, you know, something like that. I don't know. I, I hope I covered a cursory overview of GABA and glutamate um, and how they're affected by benzos. I know that the podcast doesn't necessarily allow us a lot of time to go into detail on these things, and I don't know that we really want to. This is not the media for that. That's where the books come in, and that's where websites and articles come in. If you want to learn more, please check out my book, check out our website, go to other websites, and learn what you can. There's all kinds of research on this. One thing I do want to make sure that we remember is that this is only one of the several areas where benzodiazepines have an effect on our bodies. Others have been studied, and new ones are being found all the time. Acetylcholine, noradrenaline, dopamine, serotonin all come into play. Even mitochondrial peripheral BZ receptors come into play. And of course, the dreaded learning effect, which Ashton speaks of. All of these are factors and many more. This is not simple, not by a long shot. It's taken us 50 years to try to figure out how these things work, and it's going to take us a while longer to truly identify the mechanisms in play. But we're learning more every day and making progress. We'll revisit the science of benzos again in a few weeks and share some of the other processes affected by these drugs. I, I hope this wasn't too cerebral for some or too basic for others, but it made my brain hurt, <laughs> and I'm the one who wrote it, so hopefully, hopefully it provided some information to everyone. For those medical professionals and researchers out there, let me know if I screwed up. I am happy to go back and make any corrections. Thanks. And that wraps up our feature. Let's pause for about 30 seconds for our disclaimer. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical, health, or psychological advice, nor any other kind of personal professional services. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benson Free Podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering or any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. And that brings us to our closing, our moment of peace. It's just one minute, and it's an opportunity to quiet your mind a bit before you return to the chaos of the real world. The way this works is that I will give you a brief introduction, perhaps a suggestion of something to focus on. Then I will play a soft bell, which will indicate the start of the one minute. This will be followed by another soft bell, which will indicate the end of one minute. And that will be the end of the episode. Feel free to continue to meditate if you choose. If not, continue on with your day. And as always, please remember to only do this if you are in a safe place, a place where you can close your eyes, relax, and meditate, and not put yourself at risk or others. Today we're going to do a joyful healing meditation. Much like the intro in today's episode, we're training our minds to accept joyful thoughts. It's really quite basic and effective. We all have a happy place. Perhaps more than one. But you only need one for this meditation. For some, it'll be a white sand beach on St. Martin. For others, it might be a mountain stream in the Andes or a mountain top in Nepal. Or watching a deer snack on the lush grasses of a green valley. Or just listening to the laugh of a child. It doesn't matter. Just choose a place with no stress where you can relax and escape your worries. There are no symptoms here. No pain, no worries, no confusion. Just peace. The goal here is to relax and let positive thoughts permeate your brain and let the negative ones pass. So let's get started. 
close your eyes and relax. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let it out slowly. Let's do that again. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. Let it out slowly along with all the stress of your day. One more time. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let it out slowly, relaxing your entire body. Now just breathe slowly and normally. And imagine yourself in your happy place, at peace, no worries, no pain, no stress. If your mind wanders, gently bring it back to the sea, no judgment. Your mind will wander, and that's okay. Continue to do this for one minute. Next episode is episode 19 and it will be released next Wednesday. Thank you again for joining me today. And please, let me know how we did. Or just reach out and say hi. Keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. I'll see you next time. Thank you.